So this morning we covered, <coughs> we covered barriers and using frameworks to identify or take a comprehensive approach at identifying those barriers. And what we'll be focusing on for the rest of the session uh, this afternoon is once we've identified those barriers, how do we go about designing interventions to, um, to change behaviors by addressing those barriers? Um, so if we go back to the um, Ian Graham's knowledge to action cycle, what we've gone through um, from the start, um, just to situate ourselves, um, we've talked about how knowledge is created into synthesis, into uh, systematic reviews, um, which ultimately helps us to identify problems um, and start to address barriers. And now what we're at is how do we actually select, tailor, and implement interventions to address um, um, those barriers? Um, so the approach that we, we tend to take is, um, is when we're choosing different types of implementation interventions, should start by that first, as we talked about, diagnostic assessment of barriers, ideally with some sort of framework, um, to, to start to develop an understanding of how this intervention might work, the mechanism of actions, and that's what the theory can provide you. Start to develop some empirical evidence about the effects of the interventions, but also root this within available resources, practicalities, and logistics. So it's not always about developing the Rolls-Royce intervention every time, but something at least that makes uh, an incremental benefit would be good as well. Um, so this is a, an example of, um, a really nice example of how to use uh, a framework such as the TDF to develop an intervention. So this is led by someone called Simon French, who used to be in Australia, now I think is based in que Queens? Queens in Canada, um, where they went and specifically did what we asked you to do, start to go through using the TDF to identify barriers and facilitators and then identify uh, how we might go about changing that. And specifically, they, within that paper, what's nice about it is they identify four main aspects to designing an intervention in this way. So it starts with, as we talked about, who needs to do what differently, and then using a theoretical framework um, to identify barriers and, and enablers. And then, and only then, after, after we've done that, we can start to look at which intervention components could overcome those, those, those barriers and enhance the enablers if they're modifiable. And, and also identifying how do we actually measure that, that particular behavior change. I think this is, further emphasizes, going back to Jeremy's earlier point about that it seemed like a good idea at the time, that there may be this desire to jump right into what we think might be helpful, what we think might work, and jump right to that third box. But what, what, what we found in using this more systematic approach to intervention development by identifying these barriers, um, um, we, we first of all build a, a cumulative evidence base, but we also potentially uh, strengthen the likelihood that that intervention actually actually works rather than just hopefully works. Um, so we talked about that. I'll go through these quickly. We talked about the first aspect of what's the behavior, who performs it, when and where, is it performed, are there practical barriers, um, is it usually performed in, in stressful circumstances. So this is all stuff we've covered. We've also covered um, using a theoretical framework, which we could use, for example, combi model, more specifically the TDF, or you could use a range of behavior change theories or other types of theories. Really, the, the key here is using a framework. And this is where we're at. We're at which intervention components could, um, could, could we use to, chart, to target those barriers. And when we start to look at intervention components, what we, f what we found useful in thinking about is, is to think about them in terms of what are we trying to change? What's the behavior? Why are we trying to change it? So these are the, the barriers and enablers that we talked about, but also being specific about how we're going to change it. And in particular, being sp um, distinguishing between the techniques that we're using or the intervention functions we're using from how we're actually delivering them. So the, the example that the gentleman here provided with the, the app providing a modeling um, of hand, uh, of hand hygiene is a nice example of that, that the, the app itself is not the intervention. The app is the mode of delivering the content. And the content really is the, is the modeling of uh, proper hand, hi, hand hygiene. And so there's, there's, there's sometimes a, 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 a desire to describe interventions in terms of how they're delivered, so a group meeting or an educational session where it doesn't really describe the content. It more, it's more about that describes how you're delivering the content. But what we're advocating is actually we need to be specific of what is, what is the actual nitty gritty that you're actually delivering? What's the content? And, and the, some of the frameworks we'll look at now are, actually allow us to have a, a shared language um, and frameworks for, for discussing the, that content. So um, this brings us to, to the behavior change wheel. So this, is, this um, particular framework emerged from, again, spearheaded by Susan Mickey from, from UCL, um, really as, as, a, as a response to wanting to, first of all, have a framework for 
um, informing the development of interventions that can target those key aspects, uh, capability, opportunity, motivation, but also to situate that in a way that allows um, people that are interested in interventions to um, have discussions with people who are at a policy level or at a, at a service delivery, so service provision level, to actually start to have conversations about the different levels at which um, we could start to intervene and how those might impact on the more specific um, determinants of behavior. And so what they did was they, they first of all, as, as someone in the back there suggested that we should always start, start how to look at the literature, are there any existing frameworks that allow us to do this? They um, identified 19 different frameworks which weren't all, they all gave a piece of the puzzle but never, none of them were sufficiently comprehensive which justified pulling those together into what they called the behavior change wheel. Um, so I'll, I'll talk you through it briefly, uh, well in, in some detail in some aspects of it. Um, so really the, 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 the idea here is that it's seen as a wheel and each of the, the three, the green, the red, and the gray, are not static. They're meant to be sort of to, to spin. So the idea here is that what we're trying to do is if we identify particular barriers that we can categorize within capability, opportunity, or motivation, there may be particular intervention types, so that's the red, that may, may be mo better suited than others to address the barriers that we identify. And surrounding that, there may be particular policy uh, levers that support the delivery of that intervention or not. And that's what's, what I find really innovative and, and nice about this model is that it pulls together those, whole, those three levels together. That we start with what are we trying to change, who are we trying to change, how can we change it, and what, what, are, what, what sort of support at a policy level do we have to actually enact some of that, if, if at all. So we'll, we'll talk about that, each of those in detail. So um, the other nice thing, I guess, about this, the framework is that the the, the categories are relatively straightforward in terms of how they're described, but we'll just quickly run through the nine types of interventions that the framework identifies. So there's education, which is all about increasing knowledge and understanding, fairly straightforward. Persuasion takes it one step for, further, which uses specific communication techniques to try to provoke a positive or negative emotions um, or behavior, so it's more, um, more than just providing knowledge. Um, then there's the kind of carrot and stick um, um, side of things that it's either incentivizing something by developing an expectation that if you do something you'll be rewarded for it, or conversely um, developing an expectation that if you do it you'll be punished for it. Um, two, two sides of sort of the same coin. Um, training, as we've talked about, is about not about education, it's about developing the physical skills, so how you do things physically, or indeed the cognitive and social skills, interpersonal skills. Enablement is um, another level of support beyond just education and training. Modeling is, is a really quite a powerful tool, um, uh, a powerful, powerful technique about exposing people to someone that they see, um, that they identify with, that they want to be with, that they, that, that they want to be like, that they imitate. So the example that Jeremy provided of, or I'm not sure if it, it might have been someone talking about hand hygiene here, where um, um, just observing someone, uh, uh, a senior colleague, doing their, their, hand, their hand hygiene uh, behavior prompted them um, to, to do it more likely, more than if the, the, the person didn't. So that's, that's the idea there is that you're modeling the behavior for someone who ultimately is trying to imitate you or be like you because they identify with, with, with what you're doing. Um, and then it also highlights the importance of potentially making a change in the external, either physical context or social context. And finally acknowledges the importance of just rule setting, reducing performance and opportunities through setting particular rules. And the idea here, and we'll get to that in a few slides, is that it's not the case that each one of these are relevant for all of the um, factors that we identify as barriers. And really, what, what um, another innovation of this, this tool that, that, that Susan Mickey and her colleagues made was how to actually map particular uh, uh, barriers to the specific um, intervention functions that may be most likely to make a change in those factors. And so we'll, we'll, we'll cover that and we'll get you to, to play around with that as well a little bit later. So this just, um, the next three slides are really um, trying to pull together what we talked about this morning into how this actually relates to, to making changes in people's behavior through those intervention functions. So um, we'll talk about um, each, each of those three combi constructs uh, uh, in turn here. So this is really to highlight that there's a link between the capability construct within Combi to the specific TDF-based um, domains, and then to specific types of intervention functions that are, would be most likely to be successful if, um, if, for example, you found that physical capability or physical skills were an issue, training would be the, the one to go for in terms of an intervention function to address capability. But if you found that something around um, 
uh, memory attention decision processes, you may start to look at environmental restructuring enablement alongside that training. That's relatively straightforward and probably uncontroversial from, from, from your perspective. Um, the next is the opportunity component of the combi model. So again, this is about either creating physical opportunities in the context or social opportunities. And again, that's linked to the TDF in terms of the social uh, environmental context and resources and the social influences of who, what influences your behavior. And again, different types of intervention functions are better suited for addressing these particular barriers. So if you wanted to, inf to create social influences, modeling might be more relevant, whereas if you're trying to address physical opportunity, modeling may be less relevant. So it's about um, providing at least a first level of can we start to, um, to be strategic about the sort of interventions that intervention strategies that we might use depending on the barriers that we might have identified. And finally, the motivation component. It's quite a few more types of, uh, of intervention uh, functions. Again, the same sort of, I won't go through the, these in detail because they're in, um, well, in your slides, but the, the, the idea here is that depending, the, the strength here is that depending on the barrier that you manage to identify through that first diagnostic phase of what are the barriers to perform the behavior, you can then start to make links or make uh, some decisions about which components you may want to consider including in an intervention. And so this is where, where I think it starts to become quite powerful, where you start to link um, different, um, so the different types of barriers uh, within the combi are associated with particular types of um, intervention functions that are potentially more helpful for addressing that. And as you can see here, not all um, um, barriers or different co uh, constructs are uh, targetable by all types of interventions. And so that sort of speaks to Jer one of Jeremy's earlier points around this kind of explains why chucking everything into an intervention may not work because not all intervention strategies are useful for um, all types of, of potential barriers that might come up. And um, by at least making this explicit using a, a, a sort of shared understanding of what we mean by each of these things, we can start to be more strategic about um, how we go about selecting the different components in a particular intervention. Um, and if you were so inclined, you could take it one step further beyond the um, intervention functions themselves. Um, and this, this, this goes back to that point I was trying to make around, um, you know, what do we mean by an educational session? What do we mean by, you know, if we're providing a new piece of guidance, what does that involve? What does a training day actually involve? Um, you can actually go to a, a more detailed level that, that people start to describe these as the active ingredients of the content of the interventions, the irreducible aspects of what are the specific techniques that you're delivering to people to try to change their behavior. And so there's been um, a, a push very, uh, coming from the, the, the behavioral science literature, but very much alongside the implementation science literature too, to start to just get a sense of, well, what are the specific techniques that have shown that, that we have, that have an evidence base for changing different types of, or for changing behavior through different types of, of uh, barriers and facilitators. And if, if we bring these to, together, what, what do we get? How many techniques do we have? Can we reliably describe them? Can we, can we classify them in a, in a different way? Um, and so this, this um, th these sort of lists um, are known as behavior change technique taxonomies or BCT taxonomies, if it's something you may have, may have come across. It's becoming more and more, um, uh, uh, well, an interesting way of, of trying to characterize the content of intervention so that if we're trying to replicate things, it's not just about saying we were, we're, we're doing some education, we're doing some training. It's actually, well, what's in that educational session? What are the specific techniques within that so that we can start to develop that? So the, um, the most recent version of this behavior change technique taxonomy is 93 different techniques, which are listed here. And I'm going to read through all of them. No, I'm just joking. Um, the, so the idea here is clearly there's, there's, well, there's a, a whole laundry list of potential ways that you could um, develop interventions to, to try to change people's behavior, either clinicians themselves or, as we were talking about, potentially higher level managers, patients. Um, and it really provides really a, a nice way of uh, having, starting to build that shared understanding. So when we're talking about um, habit, habit formation, what do we actually mean? There's definitions associated with each one of these 93 techniques. When we're talking about goal setting for behaviors, how is that different from goal setting for outcomes? It starts to be able to, to get at that level of granularity, which um, when we're talking about replication or a generalizability, we may need to start having those, that, that particular level of granularity. 
Because often, I mean, the, the, the point that I, I've seen other, uh, for, for instance, Susan Mickey, the point that she tends to make with this is that when we're talking about drugs and, and medication, we have a very clear understanding of the chemical processes involved and how the, the mechanisms involved and what, what are the core uh, active ingredients of a particular drug. Why can't we have, or why can't we strive for that within our behavioral intervention so that we can start to replicate when we know that this intervention includes goal setting, self-monitoring, feedback on behavior. That's what we mean, and that we can replicate that. So um, it's just trying to be much more systematic about the content of our interventions. Um, and so this is just a, a slide to highlight the, um, in a bit more detail, what this, this taxonomy can provide. So these are three specific techniques which may or may not be familiar to you. They're fairly straightforward. So the first one is um, graded tasks, which is defined as setting an easy to perform task making them increasingly difficult but achievable up until the behavior that you want to change is performed. And that can be linked to if you find within the combi analysis that there's an issue around capability or within the TDF if there's an issue around beliefs about capabilities. This would be a particular strategy that you might want to use to target that barrier that you may have identified. Similarly, habit formation is about prompting rehearsal and repetition of the behavior. Importantly, in the same context repeatedly so that the context itself, so the environment starts to elicit the behavior rather than having to make a specific decision every time. So this starts to get at that automatic motivation from the combi that Jeremy was talking about and, um, and then two of the factors with the t within the TDF as well. And then feedback on, be on, on behavior. I won't get into the detail, but the, the general principle here is the techniques can be linked to the barriers that you've identified in that diagnostic aspect. Um, um, if you wanted to go to that level of granularity. But I think what we're talking about today is really at the, beha at the behavior change wheel level, which at least provides that first level of types of intervention functions which can allow you to, to dig a bit deeper if you, if you wanted to. Um, so we talked about that. So, the, so, the re so we talked about the types of interventions that we could use to target the, that green bit, the, gom the, the combi component. Um, but again, one of the, the strengths of this particular framework is, is how that makes the link to the different policy levers that either are, are, are already in place or that could be put in place if, the, if the, there's the opportunity to do so. Um, so this, this is probably, uh, um, for some of you maybe, you know, familiar or even used to using this, these sorts of policy levers to try to change. And I think the idea with this framework is that what it's trying to communicate is that the guidelines in and of themselves aren't going to change the behavior. The guidelines will be enacted through a particular strategy which will ultimately change, address some of the factors that determine behavior, but it's not the policy itself. It's, it's, it, the policy will support the change, but it will not cause the change is how it's, it's described within this particular framework. So um, the, the seven um, policy levers that are described in this model are, as you see, environmental social planning, um, communication marketing, legislation, um, service provision changes, actually having regulations, um, fiscal measures, and producing guidelines are all different types of s ways of supporting um, these, these intervention functions. And again, um, they've done the work to, to actually map how these policy categories might be best suited to support different types of interventions. So for example, um, if you had legislation at your disposal, that would be, as you can see, quite helpful for a number of different inter interventions, except for modeling. So if you're doing a modeling intervention, legislation may be less helpful. Um, similarly, if you're trying to, cha to, um, uh, to do some education or persuasion, fiscal measures may be less helpful than others. Um, and uh, as you can see, the, the, you can map those on to, to, to the different types of intervention functions within the, the combi model. Um, so that's, um, that's the... The, the behavior change wheel, I guess, in a nutshell. Does anybody have any questions about the, the behavior change wheel, either initial reactions about its potential utility or not, or any questions about anything that I specifically said that might not have been clear? Yes. Thank you. Uh, speaking on behalf of NEQOS, where we use outcome measures considerably, um, we often do them and present them in the hope of changing behavior. And you mentioned in the taxonomy that comparison of outcomes is a, a key intervention. And I'm not quite sure how it all fits in from your perspective, and or in an ideal scenario, how you would use metrics. Well, metrics comes into the, the sort of uh, audit and feedback kind of perspective that you're providing feedback on performance, and ideally through social comparison as well, that you're providing feedback on not only an individual's behavior, but um, compared to other people. Um, let me see where that would fit. And in an ideal setting, 
how would you enable that to happen? Would you develop the data collection yourselves? Or is it OK to use data from other organizations? Uh, that's probably not a it's probably just, this framework doesn't answer that question, I think. Um, Do you? Yeah, go for it. I mean, some of the issues around audit and feedback is the kind of people's response if they don't like it to the data are crap. Mm -hmm. exactly. my patients are different. I think that's what I'm getting at. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think whenever you're designing audit and feedback, you have to think about the credibility of the data and as much as possible protect um, uh, against that. But um, the cost of audit and feedback is such that if you, if you have to design the audit and feedback yourself and you have to go and do it, that often becomes a barrier to actually um, getting it done. So I, I think in terms of choice of the data sources, then if there are reasonably robust measures that you can access from elsewhere, um, then you know, I would use that. But you might have to then think about how do you defend yourself from that, the data are crap. Um, the kind of my patients are different is a kind of different issue and it's part of a defense around that. So I, I yeah, my, my guess is it would be a decision in terms of resources for, if you're using other data, it's likely it doesn't quite answer the question you want it to answer, but whether it's sufficiently close and sufficiently reliable that it's a reasonable sort of measure of what you're interested in that you can then sort of um, um, you know, use as part of your audit and feedback. Can we go back to the BCT? Yes. Oh. Yes. What What do people think about this? I mean, how many, looking at that list, how many of you would say, oh yes, I know what these are, or I've used these things before in my attempts to try and improve uh, quality? Yes. Hi, um, I'm a speech and language therapist, and I've actually, um, I teach evidence-based practice and critical appraisal. We don't have lots of um, systematic reviews. Um, and I've actually, with a group of therapists, actually worked through these, uh, mm -hmm. these, uh, these terms to see how they apply to what we do in our clinical practice. Because when you look at them superficially, you go, oh, well, actually, they don't, really. But when I was talking to the therapists about the usefulness of having a common vocabulary that we could describe our interventions to other people, and I said, oh, this is, this is one we prepared earlier. Um, we went through it, and it was remarkable how much applied to our clinical practice. Mm. Um, and I think it was using, it, it was having a discussion about it with a, clinicians with a variety of backgrounds and working in a variety of different fields. And um, like, you, like you mentioned earlier on, not all of them apply in all circumstances, but actually a lot of them apply. And um, behind each of these labels, there is a descriptor of what's going on. And the descriptors are very um, applicable to public health in interventions like sun cream and smoking and stuff, um, which obviously don't apply to a lot of speech and language therapy things, but the labels did. And so the, you know, the sort of consensus in the group that I was with was, well, actually, if we use these labels, it's not a big step to put different descriptors behind those, mm -hmm. which make them very applicable into our very specialist area, because we do complex interventions as well. So, uh, and I was surprised at that outcome because I thought that they would go, oh no, what we do is very special and different, and they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but that might have been because they were doing an evidence-based practice master's module. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were self-selected to be more amenable, you know, more amenable to these things, I don't know. Okay, yeah, thank great. you for that. And what about I mean, people involved more in the kind of direct improvement stuff? Is this language that you've come across before? Is it something you feel comfortable with? Does it feel completely alien? Thank you. Some of them, I guess, um, sound as though they might either be things that are done regularly in my, my field, which I guess is a lot of policies around changing clinical practice, 
but I don't think I would use any of I'm struggling to find a word on there that I would use in my daily working life. I wouldn't regularly talk about punishment or removing rewards, particularly. <laughs> you know, that, that mm -hmm. has no currency. But the ideas behind them, yes, yep. perhaps. Uh, I, th I think it's that, that helpful to see them structured. They're prob I'd guess they're probably half the words or phrases on there that I don't, to be honest, I don't know the meaning of or mm. would only be guessing. So, looks really interesting concepts, <clears throat> quite what I'd do with that list in my yeah. daily work, I'm, I'm still a bit, don't really know. Yeah, I, mean, I think when I first came across this sort of stuff, I was used to sort of saying, oh, there's 12 things you can do to improve quality of care. And this suddenly directly, you know, much more enriched the idea that there may be other things, new things I could do, I've not thought about. And quite often they weren't necessarily, you know, we'd have talked about things like audit feedback or educational meetings. But this actually was sort of thinking, well, how do you sort of almost uh, supercharge or get the maximum benefit out of, you know, out of an educational meeting by really thinking about what the logic plan was? And I guess one of the metaphors I've used is a bit like sort of an Ottolenghi recipe. You know, if you, I don't know if, I mean, if people you know, try to cook Ottolenghi recipe, it's never sort of, you know, stick some cumin in here. You'll normally have to roast the cumin and you know, find five other flavors to do stuff. And when you put it all together, it's really quite amazing. But it's almost like each for each sort of component, he's thinking about, well, how do we get the best out of this? And I think one of the things you can use some of these for, uh, these, these ideas about are, if we're going to do education, you know, and we want to particularly improve um, a skill base, you know, what are the kind of three or four things that I might consider that would actually increase the likelihood that I'm going to do that? And so it's almost sort of like, um, I, I think it's almost like supercharging a lot of the kind of traditional approaches we've got. It doesn't mean what we've done has necessarily been wrong, but we've not often thought about how to optimize those approaches if the target is some form of behavior change or changing a, a, an antecedent to, uh, to behavior. So, so that's where I kind of see the value of this sort of potentially coming in. Because um, suddenly I have conversations with people and they say, oh, we should do a, you know, we need to do an education meeting. And I sort of say, well, why? You know, what are you trying to get out of that? And if you want to change skills, then you know, there's four or five ways of doing it. Which do you think would be best for the type of behaviors or the target group you're working with? And it gives you, I mean, it, I think it just sort of enriches or really makes people think often about the kind of the content in a much more, you know, deeper way than they would if it's just we we'll do an educational session we'll get someone to come along who you know, is a radiologist as the expert it's you know, trying to design those programs from a you know, the active ingredients that, that I found this as being um, 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 particularly useful and there are some things in here that I would have never believed um, you know, I mean when um, Mary Johnson who's a colleague was talking about some of these things to start off with I thought people wouldn't play they wouldn't want to do this but we found that um, um, you know, people are often willing to engage with stuff and even sort of you know, you know, uh, um, uh, suspend their disbelief sometimes to play with you and, and to, 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 uh, to, 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 to enact some of these areas. And I guess, that, I mean, the final thing I'd say is that, I mean, I think coming back to your comments about speech and language pathologies, these are often mapping into sort of fairly fundamental views about how you change behavior. And we're here talking about them largely about changing behavior within for clinicians to change their behaviors. But they're also about you know, thinking about how patients or citizens might change their behaviours. And sometimes when we've been talking this through with clinicians, it's, we've actually made that metaphor. You know, this, you know, you're already sort of thinking about, you know, um, uh, we want you to develop action coping planning because uh, that's really helpful. But that's the technique that if you've learned about using that for your own behaviours, it's something you can bring into <coughs> clinical practice. Because your patients, even if they've got intentions, may not do things, and it's very useful. Or you know, you start off saying, well, this is what you often do in patient care. We just want you to apply it to your, to your own clinical practice. So again, sort of creating sort of metaphors or enrichment that, you know, if, you, if you're asking someone if they want to give up smoke or, or uh, about smoking station, you wouldn't say, you know, do you intend to give up smoking? Yes, that's great. Good, fine. See you in three years' time. Have a good job. Yeah, you'd normally sort of, yeah, we start to say, well, under what circumstances? When, how will you give up smoking? That is something called action planning. You know, how are you going to start to protect you know, um, um, make sure that you maintain your smoking station when on a Friday night you're in a bar with a friend and they go outside and uh, you're talking to them so you go out with them and they start smoking the off you one and that's coping planning yeah so often clinicians will be using some of these things I think as your colleagues were saying in their clinical practice and then then you sort of say in the metaphor is well it works you know 
we think it works for patients, it also works for us when we're thinking about you know, how we're going to change our professional behaviors. So I think there's kind of some nice sort of ways that either you can, you know, as a clinician, get them to reflect on their practice and then sort of you know, reflect that back to their patients, or this is what I do in my clinical practice and I can change my own behavior with it. So we, we've, I mean, I, I'm kind of quite excited about this. I mean, there'll be undoubtedly things that we try and they don't work and people won't play or we get them wrong. But it, it, it seems to be as a way of starting to enrich what our toolbox, uh, toolbox might be, um, and with a particular emphasis on the kind of a behavioral sort of uh, change perspective. Mm -hmm. so. Any other thoughts? Yes. I was just reflecting an observation, really, that uh, a lot of the feedback I get uh, from to, about NICE guidance is the challenges associated with implementing guidance across organisational boundaries, primary care, acute and social care. And it seems to me that lots of these uh, concepts, uh, techniques, are relevant, as, you, as really you mentioned, Jeremy, around professional behaviours and the integration agenda mm -hmm. and how how professionals can work together better, um, whether that be in a fully integrated team or whether that be across you know, more coordinated care mm -hmm. uh, when looking at, for example, implementing nice guidance. Has there been any you know, focused um, kind of implementation of this framework in that area? No, I mean, this is relatively, I mean, this whole sort of, um, probably behavioral approach in, of implementation is relatively new. It's probably been, you know, particularly sort of only on the stocks for 15 years in the last 10 years. Um, I mean, I can retrofit this to work. I mean, my PhD and various studies I did were how to improve uh, referral processes from primary care to secondary care. Uh, and often a big component of that was really trying to identify what the, you know, the roles and responsibilities and handover. We find, I mean, it's very hard, I, I, I think, to, change the referral decision-making process because it's not a discrete event and there's a whole range of reasons beyond the biomedical model about why GPs refer patients. But one of the things that you can do with some sort of very careful modeling, which is you know, working out what the handover is. You know, what do I need to do in primary care? And then uh, um, um, to feel like hand over the patient maximally into secondary care. But in secondary care, then you know, what do we do to make sure that we don't just either rep you know, repeat all those investigations the GP did anyway, which really pisses the GPs off. Um, um, yeah, and, and how do you have that handover and all the benefits that um, if you send up a patient with this sort of area, they get access much more quickly to other aspects. So I think you can retrofit this stuff but it's, it's new areas. I think you can clearly use, do this within a, a team-based perspective, get different views, see whether GPs and social workers actually have a shared set of beliefs yeah, and how they view each other, because quite often there's a lot of um, lack of understanding about people's professional training background, what they bring to the table, how you're going to move that forward. So my guess is it could be used in that way, and um, yeah, if that's where you're working with, then it'd be kind of fun to try it. Any other thoughts? How are we doing for time? We're doing fine. Good. Um, we're kind of, yeah, we're good. I mean, I think one of the issues that um, Nikos might be interested in is if this looks interesting, how do we bring this into the healthcare system? You know, what are the kind of training or resources or skills do you need in healthcare systems to be able to bring some of this in? Um, yeah, so at the moment we're presenting this to sort of researchers who are playing with this, but uh, yeah, if you wanted to bring this into um, uh, you know, a, a, a Northumbria Trust, you know, what are the kind of resources that that trust would need to actually uh, um, try this out? And that may be something to reflect on, because I'm sure that sort of uh, Jackie and Paula would be kind of interested in people's views on this in terms of are there additional things that need to be done that would help, help you to try and use some of these sort of um, these, uh, these, these, these um, techniques. Okay. Great. Um, and I think this, this next point is really just to further emphasize that not to jump straight to the you know, countrywide, province-wide cluster randomized trial, that there's, once you get to the point where you've diagnosed the issue, identified some barriers, identified some potential intervention strategies, some policy support around those, that you, don't, you can start off s slow. You could start off with smaller scale usability studies to start to develop a prototype, test it out in a few different settings, 
using some think aloud methods to see how things are working, start to refine the intervention to a point that you're, you're comfortable with, that you, you understand how th things are likely to, to, to work or not, rather than assume that because you've taken this, this theory-based or theory-supported approach that it will work. That's not necessarily the case. It still needs to be tested out in a, in a usability um, perspective. And this is just a, a paper demonstrating um, that, that approach, really. So that brings us to, to getting you to, to do some stuff again. Hopefully you're not too sleepy after, after lunch. But um, really what we'd like you to do, um, again, taking the same scenarios, um, in this case, um, taking the, the, the barriers that you identified this morning and try to identify which type of intervention function, so that red part of the, um, the behavior change wheel might be appropriate for addressing those barriers, um, and which policy categories would likely support them. So use the, the two, in your, in your handbooks, you have uh, printouts of those two matrices that, um, that kind of link the two together. If you're struggling with the barriers because you're not quite familiar with the, the, the actual enactment of the behavior, you could take the barriers that Jeremy identified in his hand hygiene um, list, for example, um, if you need some inspiration there. Um, so we'll give you 15 minutes or so, and then again, get some feedback about what you thought about that process. I'm not, I'm not sure if we, were, if we confused you, but there was kind of um, the answers that you're asking us, uh, or the questions you're asking us, the answers weren't in uh, the, the folder that you had, largely because the knowledge isn't there yet. Okay, so um, a couple of people said, how do the behavior change techniques uh, um, um, fix into the uh, uh, um, um, intervention functions. And at the moment, people haven't necessarily done that mapping. Okay, so this is one of the areas where, um, you know, I was saying it's uh, where implementation science and psychology, cutting edge psychology, are absolutely aligned. We're still, if you like, trying to understand this and make sense of it. Um, so, uh, I, I guess the issue here is that we, you know, uh, um, um, you know, unfortunately we don't have the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Um, so you won't go out of here and know how to sort of make practice perfect in your setting. But what we're hoping is it will challenge you in terms of here's a range of different ways of thinking about this that may extend some of the kind of techniques you've had before. But it's also one of the reasons why I feel like people like myself and Justin are here because I think one of the opportunities for us is. Yeah, first of all, getting reflections back from you, but also if you go and try to try and do some of these things in your own setting, there's a real opportunity to learn. And I think one of the issues for um, both the, the uh, um, um, uh, Health Science Network and in NEQOS is if you're going to do some of these things alongside doing the implement service implementation, can we also do some implementation science so we're kind of understanding what may or may not work, what were the issues that didn't feel right in a service setting that you had to, to change. Um, so we're kind of aware, a number of people came up and they were kind of, it wasn't that there was a sort of easy answer, it wasn't that there was a hidden answer you had to find, it was actually this is difficult. Um, but hopefully we're giving you a slightly different range of tools. But yeah, normally if you're doing this, you do it over a much more, you know, you wouldn't do this over a 15 minute break and expect that um, you know, you've, you've got the program that's going to completely transform your organisation. Was there was, was any, any other reflections before we go to the feedback, Justin? No, I think you covered it, yeah. Okay, but we'd be interested then in terms of, you know, how did you find it? Um, was it something that sort of felt reasonably okay? Was it difficult? Were there conceptual or, or practical issues? Did it just seem like a you know, completely divorce from any form of reality that you, you face? Um, and I'll start picking on tables if people don't want to talk to me, so that's okay. Okay, can we put the microphone? So, someone in that table, you're going to have to say something about what you found in the last uh, in this exercise, or any reflections in terms of the potential value of this. Go on. I'll start randomly choosing people at tables if you want. Um, I think we found it quite difficult insofar as it's not an area that any of us are working in or concerned yeah. with. So it would have been easier maybe to contextualize it to something that we knew a lot about and knew what the main issues were because we were just overwhelmed with a lot of interventions yeah. but we didn't know what the main problem was. So yeah. I think we found it a bit challenging. I mean, if we were doing this sort of more in kind of real time to try and develop something, then I, my guess is what you'd want is, as well as yourself and your group in around the table, you'd want someone like Justin there. There'd be a lot of discussion about, well, what's the nature of the behavior? What are you trying to do? What do you think the kind of barriers are? And it, it would be much more of a kind of iterative 
backwards and forwards. And then also bringing that kind of internal knowledge you'd have in terms of this will play, this won't play, or we're going to have to try it this way, or yeah, actually we've done that before and it's not worked particularly well. So, I mean, you really are, this is a very truncated view and it's almost like um, a, a tasting menu, but if anything here is of interest, then yeah, the issue is how do you, you know, what, how do you, how do you uh, if you like, skill yourself up or your organisation up, but also the kind of linkages to people who've got the kind of expertise. So that was, thank you, that was good. What about this table here, just immediately in front of you? Yeah. And then we're going to go to these tables over here. So, uh... um, what we did is I was sp speaking to Sarah about it. We took it away from the diabetes and actually talked about a real life example that Sarah's involved with, and then looked at how you would apply the techniques mm -hmm. to deal with that. And in particular, what we did, like for both visual people, is the behavioural uh, circle the wheel, sorry, and then the grids, because it allowed you to look at, right, well, if that's the problem, where does it fall, and then what could the type of interventions look like? Yeah. So we took it away from the diabetes hand wash and just started talking about an example, which was currently happening, said, right, well, if that's it, this is a process to help support yeah. the removal of barriers. What are those barriers? Sarah made the, made the comment, you have to make them specific. If they're very general, you'll get a very general answer. And then how do you use this, the different interactions, sorry, interventions, to get over those barriers? Good. And I think when we were talking, I mean, some people prefer the kind of TDF route and some people prefer the COMB route, uh, the behavior change route. And yeah, the idea is both of these are kind of potentially useful tools. And yeah, it may depend on how your brain works or you know, what might be useful at a particular point in time. Um, yeah, and if you, yeah, where you are in the organisation, at a very high level of the organisation, the behaviour change room might be the level of detail you want to go to. If you're the people trying to develop the programme on the ground, you might want to go to that next level, to the TDF and the behaviour change techniques, because that's where you'll be. But these are kind of potentially you know, different tools. I like the TDF and the behaviour change techniques. Um, other colleagues I know and really, you know, who exactly like me prefer the behavior change wheel. So it's almost as a number of routes are in, and it's not that one is right or wrong, it's just sort of what, what fits your mental model that helps you to use this sort of evidence, or this knowledge base uh, to forward the work you've done. Okay, and we're gonna come to this table over here. You're sort of you know, helping in the periphery of my, uh, uh, my vision that I, um, you can get away with it. I think we talked quite, well, I, I think it's got quite a lot of applications. I work in health improvement and um, one of the areas it, um, for um, County Durham and Darlington and HS Foundation Trust and um, piece of work we're doing at the minute is um, making every contact count. So looking at um, anyone who has contact with patients um, being able to do a brief intervention around mm -hmm. lifestyle. And I think that um, all of the tools would sort of really help with that because obviously we're trying to change patients' behaviour, but we're trying to change staff's behaviour in terms of them making their contacts count. So um, I think really useful. And I, I think one of the things in terms of its practical application is just the, the amount of investment mm -hmm. in the planning stage. So I think that I can see that you'd have to invest to save. So you'd have quite a lot of resource in the kind of initial phases of planning your project and a lot of thought in terms of, I guess, the, the, the theory and understanding the theory and how it would apply and, and which bit of theory might you use. And we, you know, But I think that that would have probable um, better outcomes as a result. So it's kind of just getting that investment in there and kind of sort of pump, you know, loading it. Um, but yeah, it absolutely makes sense, really. Okay. I don't know if there are any I, mean, I, mean, I think there is the idea about sort of you know, wh you know, when you want to invest in these kind of behavioural approaches. So if you take the physician and hygiene, this has been a problem that's been on for, going on forever, thrown lots of stuff out of it, nothing stuck, it seems sensible to say, OK, we'll invest a bit more time and energy within this. But it may be in some areas there's some very obvious sort of, you know, we really, you know, if we don't do A, then nothing's ever going to happen, so let's go do A and see what happens after that. And then you know, when would we want to invest more? My guess is if people get used to these kind of ideas, it will probably anyway, without going in at a very deep level, just make you reflect more on a broader range of issues or, or barriers, and then what are the kind of challenges that, or, or interventions that might be useful. But I think you can kind of have a graded level of, of the extent to which you really want to you know, go, you know, do a very deep dive on this, or you, some of these concepts may still be useful by just sort of thinking through you know, um, where, where, where you're at. 
Uh, what about that table there? Because I'm not sure we've heard anything. Uh, this one. Uh, that one, yes. These are results from table six. <laughs> 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 it, well, we had a very interesting conversation about the policy categories. Um, we couldn't quite understand why they're called policy categories, so we talked about definitions and wanting to understand those definitions a bit more. So that, was, that would be, you know, we're looking forward to hearing a bit more about that or reading into it afterwards. But it, it, it kind of got us on to other drivers that impact clinicians at, at, at the coalface. So talking about sequin targets and, mm. you know, how that can try to translate then into dashboards that are red. And so when the likes of me go in and say, let's try and look at some of these important behavioural things that we can do. People go, well, I'm sorry, I've got five minutes to do this. I've got to get my dashboard from red to green. And it's very demotivating. Mm. So we kind of had a, an overarching conversation about some of those dynamics. Anything to add, And I think the comment earlier about sort of almost the, you know, the targetization is something that, if you like, can damage the sort of more holistic view about sort of healthcare mm -hmm. if taken to an extreme. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to some extent, those they are. I mean, they're represented here because the targets are the kind of incentivization, or the um, um, I guess you've got punishment as part of that um, um, within it. So I mean, they're kind of they're, they're mechanisms, and one might argue that actually what we need is a much more rounded set of mechanisms. I mean, again, we often tend to choose a very narrow range of them. Do you want to say anything about? The, um, I deliberately didn't put a lot of detail at the policy level because I confess that's, that's the level at which I, I don't operate best at. That's not my expertise, but I think if you, if you did want more information on that, there's, there's a lot more within the papers involved in the behavior change wheel. And um, just to say also that when, when Jeremy was saying where, where behavioral science and implementation science are, are kind of ne are, are in parallel at the moment, this, a lot of what we've just presented has just, just been published within the past two weeks. So um, I, I, we're also just keeping up with the, with the trend and trying to, 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 to convey that to you as well uh, at the same time. But I would definitely encourage you to, to have a look at the, at the paper, um, the Behavior Change Wheel paper, which, which will answer that definitions question for policy. Yeah, I mean, we could provide sort of, you know, kind of a, a reading list for the next level down across most of these things that might be a useful sort of follow up looking at uh, uh, Jackie in terms of just where people might be able to get these. Okay, um, I think we've probably across the day so far heard from every table, but are there any kind of, um, um, without me press counting any other tables, any other views? Does anyone think that what they've heard about heard, uh, 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 I mean, there must be someone in the room who's sitting there thinking, this really doesn't look very helpful. Yeah, actually, in the reality of my world, this doesn't look as though it's going to be particularly useful for me. Um, and, it, I, and, I, and I think that's a very legitimate sort of um, response. Anybody kind of feeling a bit sort of iffy about all of this stuff? Go on, there must be some. Hey, okay. <laughs> Two on this table. It's, uh... <laughs> it's um, the coercion bit, I have to say. Um, coming from a research background, I can't coerce, persuade, or incentivize anybody to do anything. And I just think, I wouldn't dream that on a child, never mind a worker, never mind a patient. I just, coercing someone with a punishment is the wrong way, in my opinion, to change behavior. So I'm quite shocked that it's even there. I mean, I just don't think it has a place in this, personally. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's meant to be agnostic. We're not saying that we advocate any of these. It That's is meant good. as a tool to make a decision on which one you think may be appropriate. But it sort of does the fact that it's included in the wheel it sort of seems to imply that that's a, tool, a method that could be used. So, and, you know, everyone has targets waved over their heads and hit over their backs. And it doesn't, I don't think it improves the experience for staff or patients. So I think it's quite damaging in, in actual case. So, so you, you may well be right. I mean, I think the issue is that this is trying to be comprehensive. These are things that can change behavior. You may say philosophically, we would never want to do that because all the, you know, the unanticipated, unanticipated consequences might be quite grave. Or you may say, for, yeah, there may be very specific behaviors that are so important or so extreme that you would say, actually, we will think about doing it. So it's not, I mean, no, there's no, I don't think in any of these things there's any value judgment that's right or wrong. There's just a range of tools. You know, you can use the dark side or you can use the force. <laughs> and, you know, in general, you know, you probably don't want to use the dark side, but sometimes it might be helpful to use the dark side. So it's pro I mean, I don't think there's any value judgment in, in any of these things. I look at some of these things and some of them I think, 
you know, unlikely for useful, I don't feel very comfortable with them, but they're just sort of saying, here's a range of, of ways of, of thinking about stuff. Do you want to pass the microphone across? Go on. <laughs> Mine's from a slightly different point of view, because um, up until this section, I've thought that it's very useful, but I feel as if it's becoming um, elongated and extended, yeah. and the timeliness of following this sort of framework that's what I'm starting to question, um, the benefits against the timeliness. Yeah. yeah. So some of that may be about the urgency. Some of it may be about the kind of uh, uh, how much this has been a problem. So the physician hand hygiene has been a problem forever. Um, yeah, and whilst one might say it's terribly urgent, um, you know, taking a little bit of time may not be a major issue around that. The other issues we're going to talk about, I mean, it can become quite truncated. Yeah, so um, I think when we talk about the physician hand hygiene thing, the intervention was probably developed relatively quickly, having done that initial assessment. Um, you can also think about cutting the corners. We're kind of laying it out in a very logical way. You could say we'll use the um, we'll use uh, the TDF within you know the, the quality group of the hospital. Uh, so we're not going to go and do lots of interviews with clinicians. We're going to think we hopefully have got enough knowledge within our senior management team or our quality group, but we use the TDF as a way of trying to internally make sure we're not forgetting anything. You know, so, I mean, what we've got are a set of tools, and then you think about, well, how deep do you want to go for any of these? How much do you want to you know, invest in terms of um, you know, developing interventions uh, uh, um, that are going to be very, um, um, you yeah, that could be time-consuming and resource-intensive? But I think those would be choices, but some of the ideas behind this could be applied at relatively sort of you know, quick and, and dirty approaches as well. Um, so you know, it's, it's trying to find the right balance, because I think then people in the service, you've got to deal with what your day-to-day -day reality is. And so you know, hopefully some of these ideas will be helpful, but it, we're not sort of saying there's, you have to do this, and it has to look like a Rolls Royce. It could easily look like a, you know, a Ford Focus or whatever, um, if it's something that's sort of actually helpful for you. Or there may be times where you think, yeah, this isn't very helpful and we'll do this because we know we can do this. That's yeah. fine. Use the best bits. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any um yeah, at the back. And we're still making sense of it. Yeah, we're still trying to do this in real time, you know, to, to, to understand what, what the limitations of this are and the benefits. But you didn't get any negatives. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. What what, what I, my sense is that people in this room are trying to deal with real-world problems in yeah, the normal, you know, lovely chaos and mess of the healthcare system. Um, and we're giving you almost like a glossy sort of... I mean, I, I do have a slide that says, that, well, um, um, we need to see the world as it really is, not how we'd like it to be. And the world is more like, going to be more likely to be um, like Blade Runner rather than Star Trek. And we're giving you this kind of almost a Star Trek version where it looks very clean, but it's going to be messy and horrible and rainy, and there's going to be sort of replicants running around the streets <laughs> trying to disrail you. Um, thank you, first. I mean, it is, it is uh, really helpful to have the opportunity to sit and work through practical examples and try and apply the, some, of, some of the tools that I've had a little bit of awareness of. Second, I made a point earlier about some of the language. I think I asked Justin to put this up earlier while we were working through, because in discussing it between the three of us, we got really, really lost in a lot of the language. Yeah. And you, I understand the motivation for wanting to say these are the words and everybody needs to share that understanding of these words before you can work together. Actually, in a lot of the arenas in which I work, I don't have, it, it's a real luxury to have the time to spend with people to say, right, these are the types of interventions and this is what I mean by these, these words. You more, much more often, I'm having to go into a range of groups and, and engage with the language that they yeah. use and make sense to them day to day. So I'm, I'm really wrestling with, I, I was sort of hoping from this as a, as a some tools or things I could use with different sorts of groups. I'm, I'm cooling, I think, to be honest, as, as mm -hmm. the, the days go, day goes on for, for that reason. The, the amount of stuff needed up front seems, seems higher than I maybe anticipated. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think it depends, you know, who within a team, who needs to do what and how do you skill up across a team. I go into rooms where people really don't have any sense about what behaviors, yeah, that we're about changing behavior and they're changing approaches. But yeah, you can often get people to think about, you know, if you start to get people to think about this in a behavioral way, then I think that's kind of useful. And then you say, well, there are different ways of changing behavior. Yeah, and it depends. And I think people get the idea that if it's a, uh, yeah, if, if you try to change a skill, you have to do something about different than changing knowledge. I mean, I'll talk about, you know, as a GP, um, I never injected anyone's shoulders uh, because I just didn't, I didn't believe I had the capability, I didn't have any skill. And I read lots of things about how to inject people's shoulders, but I'd never do it because I just was scared senseless that I'd stick a needle in the wrong place. Uh, and so you can bring, I think, metaphors or find stories that actually sort of reflect back in terms of, you know, here's a way of thinking about it. And I think then if you're working within rooms, it's not necessarily you have to say, and there's 93 things you could do, let's go through them. Yeah, I think if you've got it, if you or someone in your team or group have got that kind of skill set, you might as well say, well, these are the kind of things that might be useful. So if you are thinking about changing a skill, here's three or four things that may or may not be useful. So it, it, it's kind of, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. Um, uh, I think I've internalized some of this stuff. I would want to have a Justin or Justin equivalent on my team. Um, but I think there are ways of making metaphors about, you know, people often are reflective on their, about their own lives and saying it's exactly the same about changing behavior. So that idea about driving home, you know, I use that when I talk about um, um, habitual behaviors because everyone's got that experience of driving home in the car. And they say, well, it's just like that in your clinical world. And the people say, ah. Yeah, we've done stuff with family practitioners in Canada where we've talked about scripts. And I was really worried that they'd, get, they'd react against that because it sounds like you're being a bit insulting. You just use scripts to get through to patients, but they actually got it and very quickly we're thinking about the implications. So I think you know, there's a whole set of issues about how do you, you know, we, we're talking about a knowledge base here that may be helpful for thinking about a broader range of perspectives you can bring to a day-to-day -day job. I think then there's a whole range of issues about how do you represent that with the clinical groups you're working. And there's an awful lot you don't have to sort of surface for them because it's just going to irritate them or turn them off, which I think is what you're saying. Um, but I think there's ways of doing that, uh, ways of, of bringing these ideas in that actually people quite get and quite enjoy.